very bottom of page 28, but sometimes the knowledge of the scholar is a bit hard to understand because it doesn't seem to match up with our own experience of things. In other words, knowledge and experience do not necessarily speak the same language. But isn't the knowledge that comes from experience more valuable than the knowledge that doesn't? It seems fairly obvious to some of us that a lot of scholars need to go outside and sniff around, walk through the grass, talk to the animals, that sort of thing. Lots of people talk to animals, they could, they, not very many listen to them, is there? That's the problem. In other words, you might say that there is more to know than just being correct. Okay, I'm going to turn over now. Quite often, struggling like a scholar over relate, relatively unimportant matters can make one increasingly confused. Who described the Confucianist state of mind quite accurately? Now this is the first poem on your song sheet, and um, well, you read through it because it's very profound, very scholarly, lots of classical references in it. On Monday, when the sun is hot, I wonder to myself a lot, <coughs> now is it true, or is it not, that what is which, and which is what? On Tuesday, when it hails and snows, the feeling in me grows and grows, and hardly anyone knows if these are those, sorry, if those are these, or these are those. On Wednesday, when the sky is blue, and I have nothing else to do, I sometimes wonder if it's true, but who is what, and what is who. On Thursday, when it starts to freeze, and the hoar frost twinkles on the trees, how very readily one sees that these are the are whose. But whose are these? <laughs> now, this is a poem which is, is put by A. a. Milne into William Pooh's mouth. And when you read that, you begin to, to realize that Hoff hasn't just taken this completely at random. A. a. Milne has been getting at the at an attitude which you saw around him, this, this sort of pretense that we understand things because we can name them, you know, so that if you can, uh, if you can say, well, that's a periwinkle, um, as if it's taking you any further into understanding what is going on in front of you, that visual experience or the tactile experience or literally, uh, you know, the scent of the damn thing, uh, just to be able to give it a name, so that the naming of things in a sense, distances from you. It gets you away from your own perception. I know it's a problem, but no, you can then forget about it. What we have to do is go back to the reality, go back to the sensing of it again, go back to the sheer direct perception of the thing. That experience is undescri uh, undescribable. We keep trying to describe it, but if you've never actually seen or smelled, you wouldn't be able to get it from any description. And we keep coming back to the world. The world is our teacher and it is our fundamental presentation. It's our experience and that is a wonderful thing. It isn't mediated by the mind. The mind put, gets between us. It doesn't actually communicate anymore to us. We've lost ourselves. What it gives us is a way of manipulating the world so that I can refer you to a periwinkle if you've actually seen one and you can probably remember what it smells like so I can make a reference to it. But the actual naming of it doesn't capture anything that if you've not experienced that I could give you. I can compare it to other things you have experienced, and that way you'd come a little way with me, but you'd still want to see more. It, I mean, a friend pointed it out to me that with all the electronic things that we have, like Skype and stuff like that, there's still businessmen who have to see face-to-face -face the other person because they don't, can't trust them with one particular machine. And it's more, you know, they're still traveling all the way to America to do deals with people in Alabama Because they can feel the, the energy of the person, basically. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, they probably wouldn't say that, but they would say that it isn't real and that, you know, they don't understand them completely because they haven't sat in their company, you know, um, which, is, which is very important. Yes, whose are these anyway? To the desiccated scholar, that means the dry scholars, putting names on things is the most vital activity in the world. Tree, 
flower, dog. But don't ask them to prune the tree or plant the flower or take care of the dog unless you enjoy unpleasant surprises. <laughs> Living, growing things are beyond them, it seems. Now, scholars can be very useful and necessary in their own dull and unamusing way. <laughs> they provide a lot of information. It's just that there's something more. And that something more is what life is really all about. Interactions, if you're not careful, you will feel that the person opposite you is inferior to you or superior to you, and that is ego. Both of them are ego. This person is better than me is ego, this person is worse than me is ego. And it's essentially that is one of the tensions that we have to realize. Neither can possibly be true. You're both infinite in that sense, or nothing at all. So that has to go. And this, I think, is, is A.A. Bill uh, puts it across beautifully here. And uh, but Hoff's selection of it to put it in here is beautiful. And it's nice use of that word. E always busy intimidating people because these things are humorous. And we laugh with them and we laugh at them. And we've all been involved with them, particularly when we were children, because we constantly bashed each other on them. But uh, uh, whatever little learning we had, we used to gain, you know, and it, the down classes are structured so the more you know, the higher you look, and the poor old soul who's dignity in my days used to give out the milk. <laughs> but so, I mean, the, the whole thing is structured in that sense, and we have to be very careful in thinking that it's got meaning beyond that. Now, Eeyore is actually busily intimidating Piglet because he's laid out three sticks on the ground into the shape of a letter A. Um, I forgot to bring my board today, so I can draw with a web finger. Do you know what a hay means, little piglet? No, you're. I don't. It means learning. It means education. It all it means all the things that you and Pooh haven't got. That's what a hay means. <laughs> oh, said Piglet. I, I mean, does it?
Then he looked at the figures. Do you? Do you mean this A thing is a thing that rabbits do? Yes, he all. He's clever, rabbit is. Clever, said he all, scornfully, putting his foot heavily on his three sticks. Education. Whichever it is, whether you're down or you're up, it's it's both. You've been caught. You've lost the inter the actual interpretation and the description of things as them. It's meant to be for communication, but we tend to use it for the exact opposite. By um, distorting that level, we can block people or we can include them. And it, it, in that sense, you can you can hear that is that is comical, but it's also extremely sad. Did you you feel that with Eeyore? It's terribly sad. The poor man, he hasn't got a tail from the start. <laughs> but, and you've all come, you've come across people like that who are desperately trying to get on the ladder of this thing and don't understand it. Um, and not realizing that, you know, many of these things just have to be memorized. And it's part of the game. It's part of the game. Now, So this is the second principle, the Cockleston Pi principle, and it's on page 37. And that things in themselves are essentially indescribable. Um, when you realize that, you realize that any description is going to be shortchanged. And Eugene used to say that all the time. Any coinage that you make, any wordage that you made is invalid as soon as you've made it. This is why poets struggle to try and capture things in words and then realize that it hasn't reached it. They take us further or closer because of the newness of the description, or the artist does when, you paint, when they paint a picture, but that newness itself will, 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 will not in any way shine us the newness, the sort of incredible reality of this world that we have surrounding us. Do you remember when Kanga and Rue came to the forest? Immediately, Rabbit decided that he didn't like them because they were different. He then began thinking of a way to make them leave. Fortunately for everybody, the plan failed, as clever plans do sooner or later. Cleverness, after all, has its limitations. Its mechanical judgments and its clever remarks tend to prove inaccurate with passing time because it doesn't look very deeply into things to begin with, as in Rabbit's case. It has to change its opinions later on because of what it didn't see when it was forming them. The thing that makes somebody truly different, unique, is fact, in fact, is something that cleverness cannot really understand. We will refer to that special something here as inner nature. Since it's pretty much beyond the power of the intellect to measure or understand, we will have Pooh explain it to us, for which he will do by way of the Cottleston Pie principle. Let's see, the Cockleston Pie Principle is based upon the song Cockleston Pie, which Pooh sang in Winnie the Pooh. Hmm. I say, Pooh, maybe you'd better sing it again. Certainly, said Pooh. Now, let me see. Now, this is the second poem on your song sheet. Okay? And it's all about inner nature. In other words, that the words will constantly confuse you and disguise the fact that the world itself is wonderfully mysterious. 
constant, constant, constant pride. A fly can't burn, but a bird can fly. Ask me a riddle and I'll reply. Cockleston, Cockleston, Cockleston pie. Cockleston, Cockleston, Cockleston pie. A fish can't whistle, neither can I. Ask me a riddle and I'll reply. Cockleston, Cockleston, Cockleston pie. Cockleston, Cockleston, Cockleston pie. Why does a chicken? I don't know why. Ask me a riddle and I'll reply. Cockleston, Cockleston, Cockleston pie. <laughs> now, the whimsy of our character is purely to do with the fact that the word, the meaning of the word, really don't take us much further than, than, than they mean. <coughs> and you can distort words and you can play about with them in a way that you can't play around with the real world. Lewis Carroll does this magnificently in our Paradise, in Wonderland and through the Looking Glass. You can make things, you know, you can make a Cheshire cat smile. And then the cat disappears, but the smile stays. It's like the, the Zen one, where does your laugh go when you stand up? Well, you can do things with words that you can't do with reality. You know, the reality is not the same as the words that you have. And you can play with the words in such a way that you, you, your head sort of does somersaults trying to find the answers to these things. So that words are separate from reality is terribly important. And to understand that reality is the thing which is being presented that's why we have to link into that. Okay? Let's start with the first part. A fly can't burn, but a bird can fly. <laughs> Very simply, it's obvious, isn't it? And yet you'd be surprised how many people violate the simple principle every day of their lives by trying to fit square pegs into round holes, ignoring the clear reality that things are as they are. We will let a selection from the writers of, of Chang say illustrate. I struggle with these with these Chinese words, I'm sure you do as well, but I'm going to do my best. Kuai Tse said to Chang Zi, I have a large tree which no carpenter can cut into lumber. Its branches and its trunk are crooked and tough, covered with bumps and depressions. No builder would turn his head to look at it. Your teachings are the same. They're useless. They're without value. Therefore, no one pays attention to them. As you know, Shang Tzu replied, a cat is very skilled at capturing its prey. Crouching low, it can leap in any direction, pursuing wherever it, can, it is after. But when its attention is focused on such things, it can easily be caught with a net. On the other hand, a huge yak is not easily caught or overcome. It stands like a stone or a cloud in the sky, but for all its strength, it cannot catch a mouse. You, you complain that your tree is not valuable as lumber, but you could make use of the shade it provides. You could rest under its sheltering branches and stroll beneath it. You could admire <coughs> its character and its appearance. Since it would not be endangered by an axe, what could threaten its existence? It is useless to you only because you want to make it into something else, and you do not use it in its proper way. In other words, Everything has its own place and function. And that applies to people, although many don't seem to realize it, stuck as they are in the wrong job or the wrong marriage or the wrong house. When you know and respect your own inner nature, you know where you belong. You also know where you don't belong. One man's food is often another man's poison, and what is glamorous and exciting for some can be a dangerous trap for others. An incident in the life of the Chang of the life of Changzhou can serve as an example. While sitting on the banks of the Fu River, Changzhou was approached by two representatives of the Prince of Chu. They offered him a position at court. Changzhou, sorry, Changzhou watched the water flowing by as if he had not heard them. Then finally, he said, "I'm told that the prince has a sacred tortoise." over 2,000 years old, which is kept in a box and wrapped in silk and brocade. That's true, the officials replied. If the tortoise had been given a choice, Chang Se reflected, would you think he would have liked it better to have been alive in the mud no. or dead in the palace? To have been alive
alive in the mud, of course, the man answered. I too prefer the mud, said Chang Su. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> himself dangled them towards trying to get across to people. We, we talked about this, we did, we did one on Wind in the Willows a, a few weeks ago actually, about the fact that this generation of writers of children's books certainly had, were getting across to quite a formal social organisation in Britain, um, a different way of looking at the world and, and quite a magical way of looking at the world and quite a, a wonderful to championing of the simple and the direct. Um, and one of the important aspects of that is what we've got here. We've got a fellowship here of people who are working together on ideas and thoughts and a philosophy. And if we, if we can lose sight of the fact of what we've got because of you know, the, the big points about the philosophy and getting things across and everything, but actually what we've actually got is a tangible substance there of fellowship. And that's not to be sneezed at, although it would be very, very difficult to describe what it was. You know, it's one of those what and the which and the who, which are very, very difficult to describe, but we all know it when we feel it. You know? And that's important. So <clears throat> I call it companionship. Yes. That means sharing the bread together. Right. Or biscuits. <laughs> and chocolate today. Chocolate. <laughs> we were really, affected, yeah. Really bread. Yeah. It's the substance which you've got to actually drink now. Mm. It's wonderful. Yes. And uh, that's an important part of it. I'm going to rush on because we've only, as my wife pointed out to me, we've only got through two principles, and I mentioned five. <laughs> so we've got a few more to get through. The next one is Pu Wei. Now let's get to the second part. A fish can't whistle and neither can I. Page, three. Page 43. Coming from a wise mind, such a 
statement would mean, I have certain limitations and I know what they are. Such a mind would act accordingly. There's nothing wrong with not being able to whistle, especially if you're a fish. But there can be lots of things wrong with blindly trying to do what you aren't designed for. Eugene once said to me that he, made, you know, he, he, he really enjoys the John Street football, but he realised very young that he was never going to make a wing back. <laughs> And, you know, the, no matter how hard he worked, he would only become very bad at it. And that, that was quite meaningful for me, because I was trying to learn the violin at the time, and it was extremely difficult. And he said, you know, you should have started when you were seven. I was 24. <laughs> yeah. I'd hit my left hand so many times with a hammer, it used to hide. Right. But there can be lots of things wrong with blind Birds don't pretend too much, spend too much time under water if they can help it. Unfortunately, some people, who always seem to think that they're smarter than the fish and birds somehow, aren't so wise, and they end up causing trouble for themselves and others. That doesn't mean to say we need to stop changing and improving, it just means that we need to recognize what's there. If you face the fact that you have weak muscles, say, then you can do the right things and eventually become strong. But if you ignore what's there and try to lift someone's car out of the ditch, what sort of condition will you be in after a while? And even if you have more mus muscle than anyone else alive, you still can't push over a freight train. The wise know their limitations. The foolish do not. To demonstrate what we mean, we can think of no one better than the Tigger, who doesn't know his limitations. Excuse me. He says he does know. Well, let's recall how he was forced to recognize one of them anyway. Rue and Tigger were walking through the forest one morning, and Tigger was talking about all the things that Tiggers can do. <laughs> can they fly? said Rue. Yes, said Tigger. They're very good flyers. Tiggers are extraordinarily good flyers. Oh, said Rue. Can they fly as well as Al? Yes. Only they don't want to. <laughs> well, after this sort of thing had gone on for a while, they arrived at the six pine trees. I can swim, said Rue. Fell into the river and I swim. Can Tiggers swim? Oh, of course they can. Tiggers can do everything. Can they climb trees better than two? Asked Rue, stopping under the tallest pine tree and looking up at it. Climbing trees is what they do best. Much better than poos, said Tigger. And the next thing they knew, they were stuck in the tallest pine tree. Well, not so good. But then Pooh and Piglet came along. And of course, Pooh realised right away just what was happening. Well, perhaps not quite right away. Um, it's a jaguar.
themselves up first, and then they picked Tigger up, and the lead underneath everybody else was Eo. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bit of trouble you put everybody into, Tigger. I learned from the experience that was in. I learned from the experience. <laughs> A saying from the area of Chinese medicine could be appreciated here. Could be appreciated to mention here. I'm on to page 40, 48. One disease, long life. No disease, short life. In other words, those who know what's wrong with them and can take care of themselves accordingly will tend to live a lot longer than those who consider themselves to be perfectly healthy and neglect their weaknesses. So in that sense at least, the weakness of some sort can do you a big favour if you acknowledge that it's there. And the same goes for one's limitations, whether tiggers know it or not, and tiggers usually don't, the trouble with tiggers, you know they can't do everything. It's very unhealthy. Once you face and understand your limitations, work with them instead of having them work against you. That way they get in your way, which is what they do when you ignore them, whether you realize it or not. And then you will find in many cases your limitations can be your strengths. The important thing is we don't really need to know. We don't need to, um, to imitate near-sighted science which peers into the world through an electron microscope, looking for answers. Sorry, I missed the piece out. Excuse me, cancel that. Now, the last part of the principle, why does a chicken, I don't know why, why does a chicken do what it does? You don't know, neither do we. Neither does anyone else. Science likes to strut around and act smart by putting its labels on everything. But if you look at them closely, you realize that they don't really say very much. Instinct, genes, DNA, that's just scratching the surface. You know what instinct means. You know what that means. It means we don't know. But the important thing we don't really is we don't really need to know. We don't need to imitate nearsighted science, which peers into the world through an electron microscope looking for answers it will never find, and coming up with more and more questions. That's what happens. More and more questions. We don't need to play abstract philosopher, asking unnecessary questions and coming up with meaningless answers. What we need to do is recognize inner nature and work with things as they are. When we do that, we don't get into trouble. Pooh and Piglet found this out when they tried to catch a heffalump. <coughs> Not really knowing what heffalumps like to eat, Piglet assumed that they would like, likely be attracted by acorns. And Pooh thought, well, but you know what one day, when Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh and Piglet were all together, Christopher Robin finished the mouthful he was eating and he said carelessly, I saw a heffalump today, Piglet. What was it doing? said Piglet. Just lumping along, said Christopher Robin. <laughs> I don't think it saw me. I saw one once, said Piglet. <laughs> At least I think I did. Only perhaps it wasn't. <laughs> so did I, said wondering what a heffalump was like. <laughs> you don't often see them, said Christopher Robin. Not now, not nowadays. Not at this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry? Probably wanting to join in. Probably wanting to join in. And to play along with everybody else, yes. Okay, I'm going to jump from there to page 56. Right. Now we know the principle, we can think things. Constant Fry principle is about the fact that Sorry, who wants to know what the words cockles and fry mean. And it's in, in a way, it's the same inner nature. So by substituting them for the last line of each verse, we get, ask me a riddle and I reply, inner nature. Cockles and fry sounds better, says Pooh. Ask
ask me a riddle, and I'll reply, things are as they are. Ask me a riddle, and I'll reply, copper spoon, copper spoon, copper spoon pie. That's just my system. Now that we know what the principle is, we can look at its applications. We, what we were, as we have rightly recognized by now, no two snowflakes, two trees, or two animals are alike. No two Everything has its own inner nature, unlike other forms of life. People are easily led away from what's, what's right for them, because people have brains, and brain can be easily fooled. Inner nature, when relied on, cannot be fooled. But many people do not look at it or listen to it, and consequently do not understand themselves very much. Having little understanding of themselves, they have little respect for themselves, and they are therefore easily influenced by others. Now this in the nature aspect, this Pu way, what he's coming to is the point that Pu acts from his own center. And he acts from knowing himself as a, as a feeling. He doesn't have an idea of himself. He doesn't think, most of us when we're presented with a situation think, well what should I do now? And then we refer to a thought or an idea that we have of ourselves. And this is particularly I used to notice particularly on the answer, because in the answer you were told to, to feel into what was being said, not to think. Yes, you'd come on in through Sagittarius or something, and you were meant to be somebody's father in the situation, but you had to put that aside and feel the response. Now, that I think is what is being gone at here. To get into the nowness of it, to get into the nowness of experience, is to put yourself into that center, like we did at the beginning with the breathing. And to simply be, and out of that, and you cannot predict what it will be, something comes. And the something that comes, if that is sort of becomes exaggerated into movement and then displays itself into the situation. And you don't know what it's going to be until you do it. And that is all that seems to be just right. And what Hoff is getting at here. And is that Milne has written this into, probably unknowingly, I'm not saying he understood anything about Taoism or the hierarchy, but he's describing the fact that this character who is so simple and direct, he doesn't have time to think about others. He hasn't got an image of himself. He doesn't even know that he's a bird in that sense. He just knows what comes up. And ultimately, with every human being, what we are is what comes up, what is presented to us. Even if you're thinking the thoughts into your head. It's very, very strange that people actually consider themselves to be terribly creative when really what cre creative means is that the thought popped into them. And the essence of all forms of creativity is to still yourself when something pops in. And if it doesn't, you snoop it. <laughs> if nothing comes, nothing comes. Writer's block and the white sheep, the tyranny of the white sheep these things, it's like inner nature. It comes, if it comes, and if it doesn't, it's bugger all you can do with that. You can only wait. You know, as one of the famous artists says, he's the tidiest studio, hoover it, polish it, clean all his paint, get all his easel ready and sell it, and then sit for a bit, and then you do the floor again, and then <laughs> wash the pots, and get the brushes clean, and then waiting constantly for something to come, for that thing to come. And it pops in when it comes. And then we say, oh, very creative. What happened? <coughs> Something popped into my mind. Yes, you were ready, and yes, you had the kit and everything to do it there and then, but actually the creation and the spirit and the, the thing that flowed through you was pure spirit, and that's the thing which I think is what simplicity is all about. And understanding words and things like that will help you in the situations, but they are not what the essence of you is about. The essence of you and me and everybody is to get into that state in which that is flowing through us. The other things we've got to do, like make a living and entertain people and do that stuff and, and eat and whatever, and all those other sorts of things are secondary. And there are other things which are interesting and tight sometimes and tense at other times and good fun at other times. But the essential thing is to get into that creative state. And then it flows. If the right person does the wrong thing in the right way, so the thing is to get into the center, get that right. The consciousness, the state of your consciousness, as Eugene always says to us, is the most important thing. First find the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added on to you. Don't try and add everything else onto you and then look for the kingdom of heaven, because you won't get that. So 
This is, I think, this is the essence of what this book is saying, translated into Eugene terms, um, that you know we have inside us that essential core, but we will never understand it as a thought. It will never speak to us in words. It will speak to us so directly in behaviour. <coughs> and if we can rest on that, and that's the wisdom of insecurity, if we can rest on that, that something will come through when we're there in the situation. We can't creep into what am I on earth am I going to do? What am I going to say to this chap when that happened? And just think if that happened as well on top of this, then I haven't got a dog's chance. That's the sort of stuff that goes through your head. Food doesn't do that. There's enough now they just do it. You know. And if everyone keeps quiet, you can hear the honey calling to them. <laughs> 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 we used to do a lot of work on things like remote viewing and stuff, and it's all all this sort of stuff becomes relatively simple if you can calm your mind down and you just start to get right answers. Not right in any sense that you give them to somebody and say, this is what you should always do in this situation because it's different than every other situation. But if you quiet that talking head down and feel, you often get some really good information. Right. Right, we can work with our own characteristics and be in control of our own lives. The way of self-reliance starts with recognizing who we are, what we've got to work with and what works best for us. Sooner or later, we are bound to discover some things about ourselves that we don't like. But once we see they're there, we can decide what we want to do with them. Do we want to get rid of them completely? Change them into some of the other things? Or do we want to use them in beneficial ways? The last two approaches are often especially useful since they avoid um, head-on conflict and therefore minimize struggle. They allow those of us to transform characteristics into the list of things that help us out. In a similar way, instead of struggling to erase what we are, what we have referred to as negative emotions, we can learn to use them in positive ways. We could describe the principle like this. While pounding on the piano keys might produce noise, <laughs> removing them doesn't exactly further the creation of music. <laughs> the principles of music and living aren't all that difficult. Right. <clears throat> I'm jumping ahead again now. So rather than work against ourselves, all we need to do in many cases is to point out our weaknesses or unpleasant tendencies, point out our weaknesses or unpleasant tendencies in a direction different than what we've been doing. The following incident recorded by the Taoist can serve to illustrate. In the state of Chu, a housebreaker became a soldier under the general um, Chu Fa a man known for utilizing the abilities of others to a remarkable degree. A short while later, Chu was attacked by the army. That's when Chu Fa's men went out to counter the attack, but were driven back three times. The strategists exhausted their minds while the enemy forces grew stronger. At that point, the housebreaker stepped forward and asked for a chance to work for the defense. The general granted his request. That night, Housebreaker sneaked in, out into the Chu camp, entered the general's tent, and removed the curtain from the bed. Chu Fa sent them back the next morning by special envoy with a note which explained that they had been found by some men who were out gathering firewood. Mm -hmm. The following evening, the housebreaker removed the Chu, the Chu general's pillow. The next morning, it was returned with a metal seat like the first. On the third night, the housebreaker removed the general's jade hairpin returned the next morning. That day, the Chu general called his six officers, to get officers together. One more night, he warned, and it will be my head. And the troops were ordered to break camp and to return home. <laughs> it's a lovely story. <clears throat> so quite often, the easiest way to get rid of a, of a minus is to change it into a plus. Sometimes you'll find that characteristics you're trying hard to eliminate eventually come back anyway. But if you do the right things, they will come back. 
back in the right ways. And sometimes those very tendencies that you dislike the most can show up in the right, in the right way at the right time to save your life somehow, if that's ever happened to you. You'll think twice before sorting, setting out to completely unbalance yourself. What do we mean by unbalance yourself? Well, you remember the situation with Tigger. How did you fall in, Eeyore? asked Rabbit. I didn't, said Eeyore. Uh, but, but, but how? I was bounced, said Eeyore. <laughs> oh. Did somebody push you? said Root. Somebody. Bounced me. I was just thinking by the side of the river, thinking, if any of you know what that means, when I received a loud bounce. Oh, Eeyore, said everybody. Are you sure you didn't slip? said Rabbit. Oh, of course I slipped. If you were standing on the slippery bank of the river and somebody bounces you loudly from behind, you slip. <laughs> what do you think I did? But who did it? said Ruth. Eeyore didn't answer. I suspected, suspect it was Tigger, said Pickup nervously. But Eeyore, said Pooh, was it a joke or an accident? I, I mean, I didn't stop to ask Pooh. <laughs> Even at the very bottom of the river, I didn't stop to say to myself, is this a hearty joke or is it the merest accident? <laughs> I just floated to the surface. <laughs> so to remove the bounce from Tigger, Rabbit came up with another one of his famous plans. Rabbit, Pooh and Piglet would take, a, take Tigger to the, somewhere at the top of the forest where he'd never been and they'd lose him there. <laughs> Tigger <laughs> would bounce no more. Well, so much of a cleverness, as Eeyore might say, because as things turned out, Rabbit got everybody lost, including himself, <laughs> everybody but Tigger, that is. Tigger didn't get lost. As it so happens, not even in the mist at the top of the forest, and that proved to be very useful, because although Pooh and Piglet found their way back after a while, where's Rabbit? I don't know, said Pooh. Oh, well, I expect Tigger will find him. He's sort of, he's sort of looking for me. Oh, said Pooh. I've got to go home for something then, and so has Piglet, because we haven't had it very yet, and it's a bit important. I'll come with you, said Christopher Robin. So he went home with Pooh and watched him for quite a long time. And all the time he was watching, Tigger was tearing around the forest, making loud yapping noises, and calling for Rabbit. And at last, a very small and sorry Rabbit and the small and sorry rabbit rushed through the mist of the noise and it suddenly turned into a tigger, a friendly tigger, a grand tigger, a large and a helpful tigger, a tigger who bounced. If he bounced at all in just the beautiful way that a tigger ought to bounce, oh tigger, I'm glad to see you, said rabbit. As in the story of the ugly duckling, when did the ugly duckling stop feeling ugly? When he realised that he was a swan. Each of us has something special, a swan of some sort, hidden inside somewhere. But until we recognise that it's there, what can we do but splash around and tread in water? The wise are who they are. Sorry, the wise, who they are, they work with what they've got and do what they can do. There are things about ourselves that we need to get rid of. There are things we need to change. But at the same time, we do not need to be too desperate, too ruthless, and too combative with ourselves. Along the way to usefulness and happiness, many of those things will change themselves, and the others can be worked on as we go. The first thing we need to know is to recognize and trust, and trust our own inner nature. But within the ugly duckling is the swan. Inside the bouncy tigger is the rescuer who knows the way. And in each of us is something special that we need to keep. After a long time, they looked at the river beneath them, saying nothing. And 
and the river said nothing too, for it felt very quiet and peaceful on the summer afternoon. I think it's all right, really, said Piglet lazily. Of course he is, said Christopher Robin. Everybody is, really, said Pooh. That's what I think. <laughs> but I don't suppose I'm right. <laughs> said to itself, there's no hurry. We'll get there someday. Now we come to what could be called the most characteristic element of Taoism in action. It's known as Wu Wei. It is also the most characteristic element of Pooish in action. Pooishness in action. In English it's not known much for anything in particular. We believe that it's, ti that it's time when someone noticed it and called it something. So we're going to call it the Poo Wei. Literally, Wu Wei means without doing, causing, or making. But practically speaking, it means without meddlesome, combative, or egotistical effort. It, means ra it, it, it seems rather significant that the character Wei developed from the symbol for a clawing hand and a monkey. Since the term Wu Wei means no going against the nature of things, no clever tampering, no monkeying around. The efficiency of Wu Wei is like that of water flowing over and around the rocks in its path. Not the mechanical, straight line approach that usually ends up short circuiting natural laws, but one that evolves from an inner sensitivity to the natural rhythm of things. Let's take an example from the writings of Chang Tzu. At the Gorge of Li, the great waterfall plunges for thousands of feet. Its spray is visible for miles. In the churning waters below, no living creature can be seen. One day, King Fusei was standing at a distance from the pool's edge, when he saw an old man being tossed about in the turbulent water. He called to his disciples, and together they ran to rescue the victim. But by the time they reached the water, the old man had climbed onto the bank, and walk as it was walking along, singing to himself. Confucius hurried up to him. You couldn't would have been be a ghost to survive that, but you seem to be a man. What secret power do you have? Nothing special, said the old man. I began to learn while very young and grew up practicing it. Now I'm certain of success. I go down with the water and come up with the water. I follow it and forget myself. I survive because I don't struggle against the water's superior power. That's all I do. When we learn to work with our own inner nature and with the natural laws operating around us, we reach the level of Wu Wei. Then we work with the natural order of things and operate on the principle of minimal effort. Since the natural world follows that principle, it does not make mistakes. Mistakes are made or imagined by man, the creature with the overloaded brain who separates himself from the supporting network of natural laws by interfering trying to harm. In Chinese, the principle would be Wu Wei, do without doing. From Wu Wei Wei comes Chan Su, self-self. That means that things happen by themselves spontaneously. You don't have to do them. That's the way it feels. 
you know, often people say, that looks like hard work, and you know it isn't hard work because you're actually enjoying what you're doing, and it just seems to be happening. That it's as if you're the way that job gets done, and although it looks mechanical, it looks effortful or whatever, often that's because there's an intensity about it, and the intensity is part of the situation. You're not having to give it, it's not being dragged out of you. Yes, I've been in those situations as well, we all have. But there's sometimes when it's still intense and it's very, very good, and it's just happening of itself. And you can't, you feel embarrassed to call it hard work. And so it just happens of itself. Now that is Wu Wei. Wu Wei sounds like the deep philosophical principle, but we've all done it. It might only be doing the dishes, it might only be walking down the street. The other way of saying it, it's something that you do for the sake of doing it, not for the result. Because our, our minds tend to be constantly looking for the finished product. And if you keep looking for the finished product, you interfere in ways. You try and cut corners which shouldn't be cut. And you can't, you don't go with the flow of the here and now in that situation. You've lost the feel, that pull of reality which is telling you which way to go. Your head can't tell you which way to go because it can't possibly conceive of what's actually going to be the outcome of this situation. The outcome of the situation of not actually knowing what's going to happen. You don't really know why you're doing what you're doing. You think you do, but obviously the world will distort the things you've done anyway. It plays about with us. Where the way it gets things done, or it doesn't get things done, is often the case. Now I'm jumping to page 76. And when you try too hard, it doesn't work. Try grabbing something quickly and precisely with a tensed up arm. And then relax and try it again. Try doing something with a tense mind. The surest way to become tense, awkward and confused is to develop a mind that tries too hard. One that thinks too much. The animals in the forest don't think too much. They just are. But with an overwhelming number of people, to misquote an old Western philosopher, it's a case of I think, therefore I am confused. <laughs> if you compare the city with the forest, to wonder why it's man who goes around classifying himself as the superior animal. Superior to what, asks Boo. I don't know, Boo. I've tried to think of something, but I can't come up with anything uh, as an answer. If people were superior to animals, they'd take better care of the world, said Boo. That's the one drawback I have to the book, is that sometimes he puts words into Boo's mouth, which, you know, <coughs> should refer to, to Milne all the time. There's enough in the Milne without actually having to do that. For down through the centuries, man has developed a mind that separates him from the world of reality. What we do, as Eugene taught us all the time, the mind chops things up into little bits, and we lose the entanglement of the fact that the world is pulling itself <coughs> in many, many directions. What you're doing is not for your use alone. It will affect lots of other people. And in fact, you're doing it because all the other things it's going to do are pulling you into that situation. So you must allow that to go with you. If you think you know you've got the finished product and you know what's going to happen with this, you're wrong. Nature will use it. You know? If it's going to last at all, other people are going to use it. It's going to hang around at whatever benefit it can give to other people and things that you don't know. So do things if you possibly can just for the joy of doing it. The sheer enjoyment of the thing in itself. And if it isn't worth doing, he's suggesting who wouldn't bother doing it? If it hasn't got money involved, he wouldn't bother. Such a mind, even of high intelligence, is insufficient. It goes here and there, backwards and forwards, and fails to concentrate on what it's doing at the moment. It drives down the street in a fast moving car and thinks it's at the store going over a grocery list. And then it wonders why accidents happen. When you work with Wu Wei, you have no real accidents. Things may get a little odd at times, but they work out. You don't have to try very hard to make them work out. You just let them work themselves out. For example, let's recall the search for small. I see this next section goes on quite a bit. Is it? You know, we're only halfway through the book. It might be a better idea if we just came back to this at another time with that refresher. It's now sort of nearly 20 past five. Um, so we've covered the uncarved block, coffee school pie principle, 
virtue we've got to put her on that sort of bed and the great secret. But I do recommend...